we're talking we're talking little delivery diaries the whole ecosystem of the delivery worlds this headline here robert earl's virtual restaurants grow as others fall by the wayside uh, earl's virtual dining concepts vdc meanwhile provides virtual restaurants menus and brands often with celebrity partnerships to existing restaurants it is part of uber's new certified virtual restaurant program Virtual Dining Concepts is in more than 3,015 kitchens with about 4,525 brand locations as some restaurants offer more than one of the menus. All right, we've talked about VDC before. Mr. Beast Burger is one of their concepts. We've talked about that a little bit. So this was talking about some of their brands doing really well amidst uh, some maybe downturn within what's happening with uh, with virtual brands. So Let's jump into this. What do we think about their brands potentially? But what do we think about our virtual kitchens waning a little bit right now, guys? I've never ordered from one. Have you guys ever ordered from one? Knowingly? Yeah. I ordered from Mr. Beast. How many times? Once for exactly. my show. There you go. Mm. That's my argument. And for you, Sean, do you are you going to so many, trying so many places, it's hard to get back to one? Or would you not order it again? What was the experience? Uh, no, Mr. Beast was actually really good. I was very impressed with the. I was impressed with the burger, the fries, the packaging, all of it. The, that was very impressed. Mr. Beast is actually opening up in Bulgaria. Their virtual dining concept <laughs> opening up, opening up in Bulgaria, and I'm like, I'm definitely ordering if I can. Um, if it's open, I'm gonna That'd definitely get some content from uh, Mr. Beast in Bulgaria. If it's open there, I'm guessing it'll probably be next year, next next summer trip. But 2024, yeah. Mr. Beast Burger in Bulgaria for the Wall Chef. Wolf <laughs> Wait, you, you know what turned me off from them is like there's a basically like a convenience store that's not attached to a gas station or anything, but it looks like it should be. And they had a sign outside with like nine different virtual concepts on it. And yeah. I'm like, this that's just not a good look. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, like basically, do you happen that- to know what kitchen, what restaurant that that mm-hmm. Mr. Beast Burger is coming from? No. See, I always wonder about that. I wonder about the consistency of that. I wonder about the integrity of that when you might have a, a taco joint in San Diego. You might have a pizza place in L.A. You might have you, you, you might have a pho place in Brooklyn that mm-hmm. are then producing Mr. Beast Burger or any of the uh, Robert Earl's virtual dining concept brands. What does that mean for the integrity of that product? And what does that also mean for the restaurant itself? You created a restaurant and you're trying to build this brand and this other brand comes in and maybe does help you maximize your time that your output is better. But all of a sudden that other brand is better for your bottom line than your own brand. Is that, is that mm. a brand confusion internally within the team? Like, I don't just don't know how that works for a restaurant that is layering on top of their own restaurant. You guys have thoughts on that? I think the second it starts to slip below, people are just going to be like, fuck it. Just get rid of it. You know, some cook could be dragging on the chicken tenders for like whatever one. Like, who's that? Who has a chicken tender? DJ Collett or one of these guys? Another one, like a chicken tender, like or uh, Tiga. And they're like, they're dragging on the fries, but then they got like an in house customer waiting for something. They're going to be like, fuck this, turn it off. That's my gut feeling. Yeah, I could see that. What happens if it goes the other way? What if? What if the Mr. Beast Burger mm-hmm. or any virtual concept on top of theirs is better, more consistent? The numbers start to start to access the other way. Do you see somebody saying, fuck it, turn off, lock the doors. We're only doing the virtual concepts. Yeah, I do. <laughs> I do for sure. Yeah. I mean, I don't know, man. I think also the ego will take place. Like, I didn't open up this place to be a goddamn Mr. Beast factory, yada, 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 that whole, you know, I could definitely see that happening, too. Yeah. I don't know. That's why I think they don't really, it's going to be tough to have any real staying power. I think they're good one-offs, but it'd be interesting to see. Mr. Beast might be the the only one. I mean, anything that could scale to that size is impressive. Yeah, he could be the exception because he's got such brand power and he's pretty embedded in this in this space of F&B at this point. Do you think put your put yourself in the operator's mindset? Do you think an operator that adds a virtual concept on top of what they're doing, be it a next bite concept, be a virtual dining concepts into their space, 
Do you think they're doing it because they're trying to be innovative and creative and have more revenue streams? Or do you think it's more out of desperation that they're not busy enough? They're not maximized. They're, they're scrambling to try to figure out a way to keep their business afloat. Rents are raising all of those type of things. What's the mentality of somebody going into launching a virtual concept on top of their own restaurant? To me, it reeks of desperation. Are any of them crushing it? I could just not know. I don't know any of them that are crushing it other than Mr. Beast. The brands themselves? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Sean, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I continue to believe in friendly ghost kitchens, not dark ghost kitchens. I think that's probably one of the problems with the virtual concepts is mm – -hmm. Um, there has to be a relationship, you know, speaking to Kyle on the on the landlord side, um, you know, creating some sort of space where we know that there's restaurants there. You know, food halls aren't the answer, I don't think. Um, but there are cool experiential food halls. But how do you create a takeout window space with, you know, a couple seats here and there so that people in in the village, you have to know that there's food there. I think the problem with dark kitchens and ghost kitchens is that we don't know, like you said, where this food is coming from. And we don't have a connection to the craftsmen, to the people that are making the food. If, yeah. if robots are making the food, it's completely different. But humans are making the food. You know, we have humans. Steven is at our ghost kitchens. You know, we have well, a human in there that is we've slow cooked this barbecue. We put it into a, a ghost kitchen. Do we believe in that? Like what I do know is that by being in ghost kitchens for the last two years, it's proven that our concept will travel for non-traditional locations. If there was, right. if I didn't go in, if I didn't open up a ghost kitchen, I would not know that I could operate in 200 square feet. I know that now. Yes, we can operate in 200 square feet, but what does that look like as a more profitable and sustainable business model? I don't think it's part of, you know, the existing infrastructure that we had, which is why we're looking at other, other partners to partner with, which is why we're looking at other stadium locations, other it's airports, breweries, airports, yeah. breweries, all of that. Um, but to your question, like getting in the mindset of an operator, part of it is desperation and part of it is innovation. I think, you know, like we're, we're they go hand in hand sometimes they go hand in hand, you know, it's, yeah. We, we went from a full breakfast restaurant and a lunch restaurant and added a dinner and a sports bar to now we're just doing barbecue and we're 12 to 8. But then we're looking at it. We have people in early. So we're like, well, what if we open back up for breakfast? All these people that love our restaurant, love our brand, keep asking for breakfast. Well, you know, it's that slippery slope. Just because you can do it doesn't mean you should do it. And once you start opening for breakfast and making eggs and yeah. bringing in breakfast burritos, yeah. now all of a sudden those lunch orders for all the barbecue that we've spent all this time branding, that goes yeah. to the wayside. So it's, you know, th there's no easy answer. Absolutely no easy answer to this. Yeah, but that's the, I, I don't think I don't think it's going anywhere. Convenience is going nowhere. People want food quick and easy and they want great food, you know, not just fast food. They want craft food. You know what Wow Bow was doing? We had Jeff Alexander. Yeah. That Wow Bow vending That's machine insane. was phenomenal. Insane. We had some some cheeseburger dumplings in the vending machine at the National Restaurant Association show. It was unbelievable what they're doing. The the thing that they're all missing is the brand recognition, because like it's like if you have to get on the platform, yeah, if you have to get on like any one of those platforms, you are still going to be outranked by let's just say McDonald's or whatever the or other one, right? factory Chipotle. Who, you know, yeah. Who's going to scroll down to the 10th ranked burger? Nobody. Yeah. If you go to the second page of Google, entry is massive. Second page of Google. No. Yeah. No. Big old, big old paywall. And there's not really, uh, you can't earn organic reach there, right? You're not proving your authority to Google. You're not proving your authority to Uber eats or DoorDash. That is for sure. A paywall. Content type scenario whoever pays is going to get that visibility so then let's let's zoom out of the other half of what this this specific article and others have been talking about that there's potentially a dwindling a downturn uh for me it's really kind of like a recoil of delivery market as a whole right so we had peak 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 potentially artificial peaks with covid and the pandemic and now we're seeing kind of a little bit of a rebalance in like what is the actual delivery market the costs are so much higher and i think people now are being a little bit more thoughtful you're seeing a lot more restaurants that are really pushing people to carry out obviously for the fees and all that but i think it's not such a 
burden for them to do anymore because I think the market is going, I don't want to pay these fees anymore. And now I'm much more willing to leave my house and go pick up. So what do you guys think is happening within the delivery market as a whole as it starts to stabilize? Look, I, I think that was, I just read an article. I think it was in Canada though. And I may have, we maybe even said it here, but like white table, quote unquote, white table dining is coming back because people crave they still want to go out. They want to go out. They want to connect. There's just got to be a balance between the two. I don't think that it's going to be. I don't think we went all the way the one way, right? Which is never probably going to stick around. So it's going to. Yeah, just we knew there was going to be an overcorrection back, right? Yeah. I mean, I, technology isn't going anywhere, and it's only getting better. I took my daughter to Disneyland for her fourth birthday, and I was fascinated with how many people were still waiting in line when they have order ahead on the Disney app. Yeah. And literally we ordered ahead. It wasn't a good burger, you know, no knock on Disney, but galaxy burger, we can step it up. Disney (laughs) The order ahead feature allowed my son and I to ride the starship ride. So a half hour, I waited in line for a half hour, but while I was waiting in line, instead of waiting in line for the burger to eat the burger, I was waiting in line for a ride. That was one of the highlights of my son's day. And when we went after the ride, we went and picked up the burger and the fries and we sat down, we ate and we saved ourselves, you know, 45 minutes of waiting in a burger line. So, um, you know, people love for it. delivery, people for takeout, for pickup, like I, people hate lines. I hate lines. Like, I literally will do anything. I, I'm the kind of person that goes to a stadium four hours before it starts because I don't want to go in with everybody else. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I, people I, are I, like, I, it's like a lemmings thing though. People are such natural line formers. They see a line forming. They're like, well, I think I'm going into that place. I remember going to concerts all the time where I'd walk to the very front of the line and be like, Hey, I have a ticket already. Do I need to wait in that line? They're like, no, that line's for people who yeah. haven't bought tickets yet. And I go, Oh, so if you already have a ticket, you don't have to wait in that line. You see like 30 people walk out of that line. Cause they never asked the question. Yeah, they weren't willing right. to look stupid and go, yeah, you have to wait in the back of the line, idiot. But you know, I like don't want to wait that line. Let me ask you a question. Do you like do you like going inside to the gas station to pay for your gas? Hell no. I can't remember. I'll go to another gas station. I will go. Yes. I will get in my car, leave there, and go to another gas station. 100 percent Then go inside (laughs) and pay. Get serious. You want me to get out of my car, go like, can you put $45 on and then I'll come back when it's only $37? Like, (laughs) no. So then you lowball it. You're like, all right, just put 20 in there. Whatever. I know it's going to be like 32, but I don't want to be wrong. And it's 26. I got to fucking walk back in there. I, th- yeah. I mean, for, aside from the, the 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 restaurant food aspect, just in terms of everything being like getting used to that, like ordering and stuff. I go to the office in the city twice a week, 100% of the time, order, go pick it up. So I don't have to wait. Yeah. But I used to hate going to the city because the apps – to buy the tickets and the app for the train schedule were two different apps. It was such a fucking like, oh, you guys can't get yeah. this together. Oh, yeah. yeah. But now they combined it. And not only that, it has on there if the train is running late. Yeah. Where the train is. And it could like store, it's got a lot more functionality. Overall, my entire experience of going to the office has been the, the joy of it has been increased by like 40% simply by I the fact it. that I don't have to leave my office to go wait online for 25 minutes, go eat. Or then, like, mm. like, do the whole bullshit with the different credit cards and different apps and all that stuff just to commute. It's, I think, all, in general, all that stuff is, is going to make a big impact on everything, every aspect of our life. Because you're not going to be used to it in one area and then just be like, fuck it, in the other area. The, Di- yeah. the Disney app has estimated wait times on the map. I just look and go, where do you want to go? And it's literally, okay, it's, it's a two-hour wait. And for, you know, Toontown, we're not going to Toontown. <laughs> Toontown. It's not happening. Thanks, but no thanks. How about well, a twenty-five like, minute wait? You gotta pay like a thousand dollars more for the speed for pass. The lightning pass. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we didn't do that. No, the lightning pass is like ten minutes <laughs> faster. My dot, my daughter got the bibbity bobbity experience. So that's that, it. That's where her. That's where the money went. We're gonna wait in line. <laughs> Pick and choose. Yeah. Fuck yeah. That. All right. So, so I guess the answer is with delivery and virtual brands. We don't know. <laughs> still pending <laughs> we just don't know and i think that's the right answer i think it's it's changing every single day i think there is not necessarily a downturn there is now a, a new equilibrium that's being formed i think 
anybody looking to get in that space <clears throat> be aware of what the actual market of delivery today is, not what the potential synthetic market was during COVID. So have you know reality check there with what you're doing, and uh, we'll see where it uh, we'll see where it ends.